if you're going to try to live in a city like St. Louis, you have to try to improve it. It is an ecosystem that is always right on the bubble, right? It can tip one way or another. And the output of one person's life can make a real material difference in a city our size. Hello again. Welcome to the Pre-Pro Podcast presented by Splice House. My name is Bill Parmentier from Old Storm Studios. I'm your host. Today's episode, we have two guests from the same company, much of the same background, and they're also married. We have Eric and Mary Toki of the branding strategy company, Toki, from here in St. Louis. Welcome, guys. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for coming. I really do appreciate it. So, Toki, first of all, um, I want to know, where did you guys come up with the incredibly creative name of Toki <laughs> for your for your design and uh, branding strategy firm? Uh, it's because I have an unpronounceable German last name oh. that everybody mispronounces. Hmm. So, And this is going back generations. So hmm. when my dad, uh, Bill Toki, was at Mizzou, where he was a football player in college, uh, all of his buddies and my mom called him Toki, T-O-K-Y. Uh, huh. So it's not something I made up. It was something that my mom and his, my dad's friends made up to call my dad that. So all my life, dad was called Toki. Everybody called him Toki. Hmm. Hey, where's Toki? Not Bill, just Toki. Uh, I had no idea what my dad's first name was until I was like 30. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, you're Bill? I had no idea. He's like Madonna or Prince. Right. He had one name. Right. Yeah, he was that guy. So that's where it came from. I named it after my dad and was smart enough to get the registered trademark thanks to my dear wife. So we have the registered trademark on that word. <laughs> do you really? Yeah, oh, we that's really awesome. do. Yeah. Cool. Which, there's a, there's a, uh, a cell phone company in Mexico City named Toki. And uh-huh. if you go to Toki dot mx.co or whatever it is yeah. yeah it's there and they keep they call us up about every three years and are like are you ready to sell that mm-hmm. and and your url because mm-hmm. we'll buy it so no. yeah and the answer is no the, the answer is no the answer is no 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 boy no <laughs> um so uh i want to talk a little bit about the company toki before we get into like more personal stuff which we will get into mary um uh Toki, in my opinion, in my knowledge, is one of the premier branding and design firms here in St. Louis. Um, You've won a lot of awards over the years. Um, What do you think Toki does differently that sets you guys apart from other design companies, other branding companies? What's the difference? We spend more money bribing judges. Perfect. (laughs) Yeah. And that's our episode. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, we I, we went into this. Uh, Mary and I met at Fleischman Hillard, um, where oh. she was on the account side, and I was one of the creative directors. And uh, it was a great place for us to work, and we were there for a long time. Uh, but when we left, we said, "What? How can we?" push design in an interesting direction. I went from there to a company called Phoenix Creative where I was the creative director. And at that time, Mary and I were married uh, and we- Having kids. uh, Having kids, yeah. We wanted to have kids on somebody else's insurance plan, not our own. (laughs) So we were like, let's get the breeding out of the way so that we can have a business that we don't, (laughs) that's far less expensive than having babies. So- um, Absolutely. Yeah, so we- we waited until the kids were all birthed to to start the company. Uh, Which we started a month after our fourth child was born. That's right. And if Matt O'Neill, you're, you're listening to this, I'm really sorry to break it to you this way. <laughs> that was why we did it. Um, and so we, yeah, we were, we had to... Uh, we had to start it like that. It was tough. I think our joke was, I had a baby and you had a baby and yours takes more time. Yeah. Because I think when you start a company, mm-hmm. you have no idea what it really takes. Mm -hmm. Um, But we were committed to doing great work, to doing great work in the city. And we wanted it to be creatively led and not led by uh, account side, Mm -hmm. because I I think it's a very different kind of result that you get. And that's really been our focus for 25 years, which was design first. Yeah, absolutely. I feel the same way about 
my company, like it's the creative leads it and like mm-hmm. my personality and my like friendliness and all that stuff. It's like the, the soft stuff, you right. know, it's, it's less about like the numbers for me and just like, I'm enjoying what I'm doing and I'm having a lot of fun and oh yeah, I like, I have a career too. So like, right. do you guys feel the same way about your company? Yes. Um, and you know, we've had people say to us, so you guys don't operate a real business. You have a, what's called a lifestyle company <laughs> because you've built it around the lifestyle that you want. We're like, there's, there is no harder lifestyle than doing things in a third tier city mm-hmm. based on the quality of your design. That's just the stupidest thing that you can do <laughs> <laughs> because what it means is you're always traveling to other cities to try to get the work mm-hmm. because uh, in the first, we ran through every St. Louis client within the first 10 years of the business. And then we're like, okay, now what do we, Who's now what do we do? Oh. We've designed, designed all the logos that we're going to get, right? all the websites that we're going to get. So now we have to leave town mm-hmm. and, and go somewhere else. So yeah, designing, building a company around creativity in St. Louis is a harder thing to do than mm-hmm. uh, doing it in New York or Los Angeles where I have friends and they never leave the, they never leave the region. There's a huge amount of clients. And well, so yeah. they're like, you guys in this, you're always out of town. You travel a lot. You guys are just having a great time. I'm like, ah, this is how people in the Midwest work. Whether you live in St. Louis or Minneapolis or Nashville or Chicago, mm-hmm. you travel. If you're in Los Angeles, you drive two hours. In, in New York, you drive two hours mm-hmm. to go six blocks. <laughs> in right. St. Louis, you get on a plane for two hours to go to Indianapolis and mm-hmm. go to you know, Cleveland and go to New York, DC, Dallas. Right. So it's just, this is the dynamic of working in the Midwest. Uh, I mentioned that like, um, over the years you've accumulated some, some hardware for the shelves, some, yeah. some, some awards. And Lucite. Yes. So listen, We're big fans of Lucite. Very rare, very mm-hmm. rare. Mineral. It is. It is. You know, it's hard it's to, very to mine. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's in the Lucite Wakanda. Mines. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there, and, and, you know, like I'm the type of person, like I just like doing what I do. It's like, it's not about the awards. I, I haven't won any awards yet, yet. Oh, the day's early. Yeah, it's early. It's, it's early on a Tuesday. Um, but like they mean something and it's kind of cool to like have people recognize your work. Like, is there something right. throughout the years where like there was one that you got or was like, yeah, this actually like really means something. A lot of them actually. Oh, there are several. Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, I'd be curious to hear what you say too. And I mean, to me too. Yeah, which ones? Um, you guys take it from here. I'll, I'm going to step. I in. think. Okay. <laughs> Bill's early taking a early on, so early on, and this is silly, but, um, and I'm it. It was an Addy, and the when we got to the Addies, oh yeah, Eric won first place. Mm-hmm. And when you you know you, when you're walking through the Addies, everything's out. This was way back when, so everything was on display, so you could pick it up and touch it and feel it. Yeah. And the award was won, and it was a binder full of research. And I love that he won that because that's what we base the company on. Like design is amazing; it's beautiful; it's wonderful. But if it's not built on deep thinking and strategy and research, Mm -hmm. then you're really not delivering to the client what they really need. You might make something pretty and they Mm -hmm. might, they might win an award, but it doesn't mean you're going to move the needle for them. And this was just this, you know, three inch binder of research and it won an Addy because it was so cool. (laughs) And I'll never forget that because it's the first time in all of the years I've attended, that that's what I saw. It wasn't about yeah, I don't think they've ever done it design. Then. It was somebody saw, holy moly, look at this. Like, this is just <laughs> research. So I'm really, really proud because I think that is part of what has made us different for 25 years. It was, yeah. like, it was like an elbow grease award. Basically, all yeah. the hard work that you put into that mm-hmm. was like they were sort of like a lifetime achievement. Yeah, and it was a little bit of a peek behind the curtain mm-hmm. because – Every, it was the brand strategy for Bissinger's. Yes. And every design project we've ever done is always based on research, whether mm-hmm. the client pays for it or not. Like, we can't just make something pretty. We've never yeah. done that. Yeah. So this, to me, was a peek behind the curtain where everybody else in town got to actually see what we do. And it was that I was really proud of that. Yeah. I mean, why do people in St. Louis, you know, care about awards? Just because, again... 
we have to work twice as hard to become recognized by our peers and how you get people to want to work with you in St. Louis and is to get people to move here a lot of the time from out of town. So we're, you know, we've attracted teams from Florida, from New York, yeah. from uh, Kansas City, Chicago. from Denver, from Chicago. And you do that because people are like, oh, yeah, I've heard of you guys. And you they've heard of us from our awards. And so it's, mm -hmm. it is more okay. for recruiting than it is for clients. Yeah. But it's hugely valuable if people come in and go, I want to work with people who care about the things that I care about. And I care about the creative. Um, those people, again, you have to find them from the outside. And especially now in a post-COVID world, I mean, this is, this is the game. We've had two hires in the last couple of weeks and one of the two of them has been from out of town both of them oh well that's true you're right the last yeah travis hires, is from yeah you're are, right. travis from is from wichita you're right it's also i think that it's an expense and a lot of people don't realize that it's a gift to your employees so we have an amazing creative team mm -hmm. and whether it's our writers strategists designers they all work together so it takes a team to win the award and by the company spending the money to enter all of these things and letting the team win. It's our way of showing them that we also appreciate what they do. Yeah. yeah. So it's not only helping us right. in recruitment, but it's also, it's a way to say thank you to your team where sometimes they're there late nights or weekends because mm -hmm. they haven't quite gotten it to where they want. And it's, it's nice to show them appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> we or from early on, we were always like the people who do the work are the ones who are going to get listed. You don't get to be a, a you don't get a pass to get on the awards credits just because you're the, you know, executive vice president CD in charge of, <laughs> you know, uh, production. Uh, and, you know, you have to earn your way onto those awards. And if you were a junior designer and you were the one who did all the work, you're first on the list. Yep. You uh, we, yeah. So we did it from basically the people who had the most involvement. So usually the, the most senior, most people are at the bottom of the list and not at the top of the list where usually they are. Right. Yeah. So like your guys' names aren't on all the awards. No, absolutely not. Oh, I'm a nun. So oh, okay. I, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not creative. I, I kind of do everything that no one else wants to do. So I'm yeah, just kind of back of house. That's still part of the process. Though, oh like my God. Supporting everybody else. Keeps it's all, us, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's like a big web yep. that like if one of the strings gets pulled, it, the, the whole thing comes. Absolutely. Right. We just pick the award up and scratch my name on the bottom. You know, Mary, <laughs> yeah, Mary, Mary helped. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, Mary helped. helped. <laughs> <laughs> So. Mary got us paid for this yeah. turkey that Eric brought in. Hey, that, that's very important. It's very yeah. important. Absolutely. <laughs> Made sure we didn't get sued for all the stupid things that we did. So what awards are you? I think I know what you're going to say, but I mean, I, I yeah, there's Eric, many ones? that I'm proud of, but that one sure. I'll never forget. I, I, you know, getting the first, uh, the first year, 96, when I got my first two things in, in communication arts, that was a big deal. Yeah. Getting a platinum award and being on the, the cover of Graphis in 2018 or 2019, whenever that happened, that was a big deal. We were one of 14 companies in the world, and there were only five people in the United States, five companies in the United States who got a platinum award really? from Graphis. And we were one of the five That's from awesome. the United States. Yeah. I mean, that was is that cool a, as heck. It, now, I don't know what that is. And yeah. Probably a lot of people don't know. Graphis, what Graphis, is. Graphis is, a, is one of the two big uh, – design journals and mm -hmm. it's the most lavishly produced ones they they produce hardbound books i mean these are oh wow these are keepsakes yeah, yeah they're and they're beautifully designed um and then communication arts is the other magazine that oh. a lot of people know um, i was gonna say highlights magazine <laughs> that well that i've never had an award from highlights but oh, really? i would i would welcome it you should try it it's, yeah it's I, nice. I, I haven't considered <laughs> pitching them uh, i'll put in a good one i appreciate that <laughs> it's very kind <laughs> so well, that's yeah that's amazing like uh, yeah, those kinds of things are really cool it's an, a huge international magazine for the industry and you yeah. guys were mm -hmm. top 14 one of 14, 14 from the whole in the globe. Whole world yeah that was fun and you know and then that's having awesome. the article written about us in in communication arts was mm -hmm. yeah was huge in yeah. 2015 that was awesome yeah you and jay going and getting the for art the webby oh the webby yeah. yeah when we beat the google when you beat the, when yeah. we beat google that <laughs> oh did you really 
Yeah. And our web team was like five people. And yeah, that was, yeah, that you was guys awesome. went and had far too much time receiving that award. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. We went to New York when we went to the Webbies that year. It was, that was a fun, fun year. And then we won and they interviewed Jay on stage. And the whole thing was you have five words. That's your speech. You only have oh. five words. So you have to pick your words very carefully. So Jay, who's the most taciturn guy in the world, was like, oh, sorry about that. Got, got to go up on stage and, yeah. and accept his award in front of, all the celebrities and everybody that were at the Webbies that year. That was oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I was home with a sick kid. <laughs> oh, dang. And we were in New York mm -hmm. party. Yeah. Yeah. We were also raising four kids at the time. So mm -hmm. just kind of background noise over here. Yep. No, I understand that. I totally understand. Um, so it sounds like what you guys are saying is that like you're a brand strategy company, but the other branding that's just as important is your own brand for Toki. It's like not only for clients, but like, Right. Hiring talent as well. Yeah. And so would do you think that like other companies, not just branded companies, but like video production companies or creative, whatever creative services or something should yeah. like focus on your own branding just as much as your client's branding? Absolutely. I mean, you're for, for people who serve the broad creative industry, whether those are advertising agencies or branding companies or graphic design firms or whatever, um, those kinds of people, the people who populate those companies, the people who populate marketing departments tend to be people who are very finely attuned to interesting creative. So if you talk to them about in, in the vocabulary that they respect and demand, which is f cool, fun, interesting, all of those mm -hmm. things, then you're going to be much more memorable than somebody who's just put together a bland package and doesn't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. So your videotape that you sent to us was awesome because we had no idea who it was when we got it. We were just like, this is really cool. I don't know what this is until you Thank called you. us like three days later and we're like, that was me, Eric. That was, yeah. that was Bill sending that to mm -hmm. you. And I was like, oh, that's why it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's and so I great. think in every- You're going to give backstory on that? Every yeah. company has a different flavor and different culture and different. Yeah, yeah. So I think it defines who you are. It, you, you know, you have to have, yeah. you have to let people see what are your colors? What, what, what are you proud of? And right. you want to make sure you're attracting the right clients to you and the right team. Mm -hmm. And I think us, for us entering awards and the, the goofy things we do, it, we tend to hire people that fit. And we have yep. hired people over the last 25 years that just fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not at a point where I can really like turn down a lot of clients, but like there eventually will probably be some clients that I just don't mesh with a whole lot. Oh, I mean, yeah. have you, have you experienced that? Like, I know we're oh, talking hugely. about branding, like this is our brand, yeah. you know, we're generally like nice, good people and we like to get along, but like there's probably a company that came along and said like, we want you to de design a brand for our deforestation company or something, oh, you know, right. something like that. We're like, eh, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of that is, as you, I'm sure know, comes from time, having the time to build your business the way it was. The first five years when we started the company in 97, we were, uh, eight years. We yeah, take, it was just five to seven years before mm -hmm. we got to the point where we could afford to turn people away. Yeah. It took that long. And, but when we got to that point, that was a happy day when we could say, yeah. we're just, I'm sorry, we can't take your disgusting, horrible, we just can't do you know, project so right sorry. now. We would love to, but right. we just can't. We just don't have time for you yeah. right now. We, we were already booked. We just got booked yesterday. So, but that has, that process of being able to hone a big group of clients that you start with who are often, they're coming to you because you're fast, you're cheap. You're available, you're willing mm -hmm. to work until three in the morning to deliver something at nine. And then over time, you're able to whittle that down and get to something that has purpose. And we literally, uh, we, about eight years into the into the company, so we're talking, you know, 2005, we had our entire company sit down and we plotted, had everybody plot on a graph from the project kinds of things that they wanted to do from best to least. And then the, the uh, yeah. y-axis was the clients that we want to work with from best to least and mm -hmm. figured out 
everybody got to vote. And we took our clients then, based on the findings of that internal survey, yeah. and we fired a lot of clients. We and that got, cleared wow. the way get, to focus on the clients that we wanted to get. Yeah. We either got too busy. Right. Or we just priced it. Or we just Until priced they it. said, no, we can't do this. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a point where you price it to a point where they were like, yeah, that's still fine. Yeah. And you were yeah. like, uh, no, no, no. Once you're, once you're, we got to those people who wanted to hang with us and they said, we'll, we'll go ahead and go with your price increase. Then okay. all of a sudden you're like, well, this pays for our ability to go over budget on these other things that we really believe in, but we don't have mm-hmm. the budget for. We also, um, have done a tremendous amount of pro bono work in 25 years. Oh. So those types of client clients also allowed us to, you know, pour our passions into the arts and right. into things that um, don't always have the funds but really need the help. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're careful about who you turn away and why. Um, and then there's also, you know, weird years where something happens and you will, you might take somebody that you may not want to do. But, I mean, it's not smooth sailing from year eight and there's no more bumps in the road. But oh, sure. it is yeah. nice to get to a point where you feel like you have a choice. Mm -hmm. Um, So if somebody would come in and, you know, and I guess you would want us to do cigarettes, that would be something that our, our company wouldn't, our team wouldn't be interested in working on. So we were also good about talking to the team about things they believe in and things they don't and make sure that we just sort of steer new business away from categories that we know they'd have no interest in working on. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a luxury. Yeah, Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. One job for you, one job for me. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I try I try to do that too. It's it's difficult, you know, at the size that I am, but like I want to be a Toki someday. <laughs> yeah. One of these days. Someday. <laughs> Tell me more about the uh some of the nonprofit work that you've done. Like I mean, how how do you find the time to do something like I know you want to because we all want to do that kind of stuff because it's 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 the right thing to do, it's very fulfilling, but like how do you find the time to do those sort of things? You, uh, we were fo- we were never been focused on making a lot of money. That's the bottom line. We never went into this saying how can we how can we get rich doing this. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole part of the equation that she and I have had to build into our lives to make that happen by saying we're not going to rely on the design on Toki to be the thing that powers our retirement and our long-term finances. That drove other decisions. By making that decision about the design firm, it drove other decisions that we had to fulfill in our lives somehow. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to try to live in a city like St. Louis, you have to try to improve it. It's not – it is an ecosystem that – is always right on the bubble, right? It can tip one way or another. And the the uh, output of one person's life can make a real material difference in a city our size, right? So somebody like Joe Edwards or uh, Maxine Clark, or there are lots of folks like that who come in and you could say they've actually tipped the balance. Mm-hmm. And there are lots of lots of folks, restaurateurs, Gerard Kraft, we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier, um, Gerard Crafts had a huge impact on this city. And it's easier, I think, to make a a bigger impact in a city like St. Louis. So if you're willing to do the work, you can make a a big positive contribution. But if everybody just puts their head down and says, the art museum will take care of itself, the zoo will take care of itself, Mm -hmm. the opera theater will take care of itself, right? The contemporary art museum will take care of itself then they won't take care of themselves and they'll flounder and they won't be successful and the quality of life will go down. Mm -hmm. So the people who really want to make this a better city for their kids and make sure that kids don't all want to move to New York or Chicago, Mm -hmm. but they want to stay here. You got to, you got to make the city a better place. We also did it strategically. So being, you know, as a young company, we constantly asked our team, what do you want to work on? What are you excited about? And we would have, like, we want to do museum work. So we'd say, well, okay. So the the initial museum work we did, we chose to do it for free or reduced or yeah. whatever combination. Absolutely. Oh. Because what it does is 
our team is thrilled to work on it. Um, the client is thrilled because they can afford it. Yeah. And we end up with a portfolio piece that then we can go and use as new, you know, new business for the next mm -hmm. museum or, and we did that strategically in lots of places. Right. So that it's, it's not necessarily free or, but it's, it's affordable to that client, but sure. giving us an amazing portfolio piece. Right. But you're building, uh, if you're doing it intelligently, you're building a business line then too. Mm -hmm. So once we did the Contemporary Art Museum work free, at frankly, at cost, I mean, it cost us because we have some things that we did, and we worked for opera theater at greatly reduced rates, we were able to go out and we got the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and we did their website. Did you really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And That's we did awesome. the Phillips Collection out of New, out of Washington, D.C. And we did work on the West Coast. So, I mean, all of, we got yeah. the Denver Museum of, of Nature and Science. I mean, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we've got museums that we've done all across the country mm -hmm. that are because of the work that we did for free in St. Louis. And then all of a sudden, we started getting paying gigs. And we've been able to do that with... Lots of different kinds of, of clients. We did it with schools and universities and magazines. Magazines, yeah. In my experience as as a as a filmmaker and like doing branded videos and stuff, like um, what I try to do is if if I'm going to give you a discount or or do something on the cheap, like right. like we said, like one for you where I make my money and one for me where I get to do what I want. Um, do you feel like for those clients who? You either do the work for free or at a much reduced rate. Yeah. Like, do you feel like you sort of push the boundaries with the creativity with those more and sort of say like, well, I, you know, if the client says, you know, we don't like this so much, you, and then you might come back and say, well, I think it's great because it's A, B, and C. And, and I'm I mean, paying for it. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm basically playing. Is it, is that how it works? I try to do that. It's difficult though. Cause it's still a client. You know? Yeah. It's difficult. Be, and, and frankly, if, if the client wants something that you haven't presented or if you have something that the client says not, doesn't work, for anyone to insist on that in that relationship, it means that there's a communication issue that has to be teased out. Mm -hmm. So you've missed something. The client's always going to know that they're balancing a craft design or branding or communication issue with what their real needs are. It's In other words, it's a tool that's servicing a greater end. So they're balancing that greater goal with the tool that you're proposing for that. Mm -hmm. If if you say, no, you have to use this tool the way that I've designed it, they they might say, well, that's not, it's not going to work for us. So there's no reason to be insistent. At the same time, you don't want to be a pushover and just do bad work. That's not why you're doing it. Yeah. So there is a, certainly a... Uh, there needs to be a diplomatic touch with those executive directors or whomever you're dealing with mm -hmm. because they most of the time they really do know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. When we did a lot of work for Coca early on, we worked with mm -hmm. Stephanie Riven, who's a wonderfully brilliant woman who knows more about fundraising than any you know three people I've ever met. And there were a lot of things that she and I had to have some real discussions about because she wanted to do things a certain way. And mm -hmm. we were like, mm, we really don't think that's a good idea. Let's talk about why you think that's going to work. Yeah. So that, those those kinds of discussions have to happen. We had a Absolutely. relationship with one of our pro bono clients we, that we did for 11 years. And finally, the marketing director and we had drifted so far apart in what our vision for the organization was. It was so far away from where we were that we finally had to go over that marketing person's head to the executive director and say, we're out, we're, oh, we're done. And yeah. that was a tough day. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But it, it, that kind of stuff has to happen. Because it has it, to. I mean, like yeah. you, you as a company and as creative people, like you still have to grow. Yeah. Right. And like that situation just stagnates you. you right. I, it I, did. I hate that. We had, I mean, it was tough. We were firing a really, firing people that we really enjoyed as people, really believed in, in their, mm -hmm. Uh, in what they were doing for the community and their creative product. And we had had more than a decade of doing work that we had in international awards magazine. We'd won just award after award for, and and we're still time. front, but it was time. But it was it had just gone yeah. stale. Not only stale, it had gotten adversarial. Well, and sometimes right, it happens yeah. just so, you know, we're huge advocates for food outreach, which is right. in our neighborhood. They mm -hmm. were there before us, and we just... 
adore their mission and what they do. And I think we help them for 10 or yeah, 12 about, years. Yeah, yeah. And More than a decade. We don't any longer, but it, it's not because we don't believe in their mission. We have a small team, and our team was just ready to go on to the next. You know, they, they, it, you, you can only channel yeah. so much time toward pro bono or so when after 10 yeah. or 11 years, if they're like, can we do, can we pivot and go over here? We as the, right. you know, as their team lead sort of have to say, yes, we can do that. Cause you, you don't want to make your team work on something that they're just yeah like, I don't want to do it this again. It wasn't fun anymore. You got to switch it up once in a while. Yeah. Like, and, and that's yeah, hard yeah. because it's something you believe in and, mm -hmm. but you do have to, you have to be able to step away and say, we love you guys and we'll support you, but you know, it's time for us to pour our energies into the next thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've done that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The whole, the, the pro bono thing is a, was, has been a, an ongoing discussion for for many 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 years. The yeah. last yeah. twenty years, we've had we've had this discussion about pro bono work and the right way to attack it. You know, watching Tom Townsend doing all the great work that Rogers Townsend has done over the years for uh, Black Rep. I mean, they've done so many interesting things, and and we've really tried to watch how they do things. And we've talked mm -hmm. to our friends at conferences. Mm -hmm. How do you do this stuff? And nobody has a good answer for it. I mean, I don't know. How, <laughs> I It's just, you feel, I think everybody's feeling their way through it. I was yeah. hoping you guys had had all that. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you. I think the only thing, <laughs> the only advice I can give you is it's hard when everyone knows how generous you are to say no. Yeah. And we made a, a huge effort about five years ago six years ago to sort of say, we really have to say more, more, we have to say no more often. Mm -hmm. And we just realized that you, you, you can be so giving to the point where you can't get the paying work done at the yeah. level that you need to. Uh -huh. So we really, you know, that that's my advice for a young company that wants to give back and, and grow their business. It's, you know, choose wisely, make sure it's something you're passionate about that can add to your portfolio. Mm -hmm. But don't be afraid to say no, you know, thank you, but, you know, our plate is full because yep. it can, you can start drowning. And maybe, you know, think about uh, exchanging that expertise for a seat on the board. If it is somebody that you, yeah. I mean, say, I'll do this for you, but I want to be on your board because then you create contacts that you can leverage into paying work. Mm -hmm. And that's, we did that for the Contemporary Art Museum and mm -hmm. we're doing it now for the okay. Frank Lloyd Wright House for the Luminary, yeah. right? So being able to say, I'll do this. And then along with that, you're going to have to write them a check every year. So not only are you doing free work, but you're writing, writing <laughs> you're them a check. Them now. But if you're doing that <laughs> to be able to leverage a broader uh, range of contacts who mm -hmm. are already predisposed to be involved with the kinds of organizations you want, you could consider it a good new business effort. Yeah, an, an investment. Right. Yeah. We've talked about a lot about like the client side and and um, sort of accounts and things like that. And sort of working with clients, but like I want yeah. to talk about just kind of design in general. Are there? Do you guys subscribe to any like? Here's our top five sort of design bullet points that we always have to hit, and this is what makes great design. Or is it just kind of fluid, like based on the client or the needs or the ask or whatever it is? There's, I, I would say that there is no recipe. The only recipe we have is what do we what can we do that we haven't done before? Oh. I was just I was telling Mary there's this there was this great story I heard I read this great article about Brian Eno it was in the New York Times about a week ago and it's a great article but he talks about how he was working with U2 and they invited Luciano Pavarotti in the into the studio to do a piece with U2 which seems <laughs> just like a weird combination mega group but they brought him in so here's Eno. And you two, and they're in the studio, and Pavarotti's just sitting on an enormous stool in the corner. It's, you know, <laughs> of course he is, <laughs> and and watching them work, and they're making up the songs in the studio. They're right, they're writing the songs, and they're experimenting. Go, it doesn't really work. Let's do something else. Mm -hmm. And after a while, watch two hours of this. Pavarotti comes over and he says, "You're just making everything up." <laughs> and Eno said it was amazing because. This was the first time Pavarotti had ever watched music being created. Oh, yeah. He's used to singing music that's been around for 400 years, and it's mm -hmm. established. He's never watched music being formed. Mm -hmm. And the fact that when artists go into projects, they don't know what's going to come out of the project. Right. 
And he was irritated by the process of creation. <laughs> it was to him, it was a waste of time. It's like, what are you doing? Can't we just get to the music? Right. And they're like, it doesn't work you, that way. Luciano, really? You've never yeah. seen this happen before. And so us are with our team. Pavarotti's like the account managers mm -hmm. and the project managers. <laughs> and it was like, come on, what's the story here? Why is this taking so long? And the creatives are like, this is what happens, man. We don't know where we're going. We got to jam for a while, dude. We got to jam for a while. We're going to blow the spit out of our out of our recorders, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and after you, we need five minutes just to get the get yeah. the flute dry before yeah. you can even think about making music. So it takes time. And then you show up one day and it's no and you're you're just sleepy. You're crabby, you know. You tripped over the cat on the way out the door, and yeah. you come in. You're not in the right frame. You're mm -hmm. thinking about you know the kids got soccer tonight. I got to. And you got to focus. It takes yeah. time to do great stuff. It's, you, you, I, I hate trying to force it. If I'm like, right. man, I, I got to finish this script next week. But like today, I'm just like, I just don't have it today. You know, right. like I, I just, I'm going to do something else just to kind of clear my head. Like I, I like having a deadline and like sort of, it's, just, it's sort of the, the procrastinator in me is like waiting to the last minute. It's like, I'm going to finish the script. And it's like, I like it. I always like it at the end. Yeah. But like a week ahead of time, I'm like, I know I should work on it, but I just don't have it right now. Well, yeah. that's, that's no. design. That's, I mean, yeah. writing is design. And yeah. you you don't get to push a button and say, oh, this client wants this. And, and you do this, 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 and you, it pops out. It yeah. doesn't work that way. You, you know what they need. You know what you're going for. But then you get in a room and throw stuff on a wall and pick mm -hmm. it apart. And it's, it's a process. It's, it's not messy. a widget. It's messy yeah. and... Um, I tell my team, there's only so slowly that you can ride a bike, right? right you can't, yeah. you, there's, you can't, if you don't have the pressure to ride the bike at a certain speed, meaning fast, the bike just wobbles and falls over. Mm -hmm. You have to have speed behind you in order to make a, riding a bike work. And it's like that with creative. If you don't have a deadline, if you don't have a little bit of a fire under your butt, it doesn't flow. Yep. So for me, I'd rather have three days go by where I'm working on something else, let it get a little tight, and then shoot a bunch of caffeine yep. and stay up all night uh -huh. and dream about it in the middle of the night. And yep. all of a sudden, I have the focus that comes from a deadline. I'm riding the bike at a good speed. I'm going fast. The mm -hmm. bike is stable. And I know, I know now, after having done this for 40 years, I'm going to be okay. I'm not worried about it. I'm not panicked. I know that this is what the process feels like. And the process feels a little like panic. <laughs> and that's just the way it's going to be. But it's a lot it's, like it. <laughs> it. It is a lot like it, yeah. which is why I don't have any molars left. I've ground them all down. They're just smooth oh. little nubs back there. <laughs> right. But by God, I'm not panicked about creativity anymore at mm -hmm. 63 years old. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. Well, it took 40 years. Right. It helps me to forget about everything else going on. Like, I don't have to put that laundry away now. Mm -hmm. Boys are in bed. Right. I, could, I just on my computer. I'm just going to finish this thing right now. And, like, that's where it all happens. Like, I'll right. have some structure in place, sure. But to, to crank it all out and finish it, last couple hours. Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely that's right. That's just how we work, I it, guess. It is. It's a it's and people think it's procrastination. It is not procrastination. Yeah. Yeah. It is riding the bike. It yeah. is it is rubbing two sticks together slowly does not get you a fire. Mm -hmm. You've right. got to put some fire you gotta put some energy into it mm -hmm. to get the energy out of it. I yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because that that's the impression that I get from if I'm in contact with a client or or somebody on my crew who's like waiting on something or whatever. It's like it's like, how, how's that thing coming, Bill? I'm like, honestly, I haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah. Like, it'll get done. Like, you told me Friday. Like, it'll be done Friday. Don't right. worry about it. It's Tuesday. Yeah. Like, don't sweat it. At the same time, do, do you, maybe you do this too. I'm, I'd be very curious. So I think the way creative minds work is fascinating, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't, this, this is me. I don't know how, what this black box is that I have. There's a part of my mind that is a black box even to me. And I know that what I have to do is I feed it stuff that's kind of around what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. And I do that intentionally. Like I, I start to – I put myself on, a, on a, like an idea diet of things mm -hmm. that I know that it will enjoy consuming 
in the black box and it goes into the black box. And this is the thing that stays up all night and and starts coming up with ideas at 2.30 in the morning. It like bakes overnight. Exactly. And in the morning, it's the easy on. bake oven of yeah. creativity yeah. back in there somewhere. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden when you're ready, you've if you've nourished it enough, it has what it needs to synthesize things that start to come out in your fingers and in your mouth and on your typewriter and in your computer, which is a miracle in, in a way. And you, I don't know how that happens. If I could replicate it, I could give it to others. Mm-hmm. But all I can't do that. I, all I can do is look for people who have good black boxes. Mm-hmm. And they don't know how to do it. They know how to teach other creatives kind of how to get there, but they can't teach non-creatives who don't have the black box, people who don't have the black box get really irritated by the black box. <laughs> they really don't like the fact that there's a black fucking box in there <laughs> that 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 you don't uh-huh. know how it works. Yeah. We have a project manager who we love. We love She's her. Amazing. But she hates the black box. She doesn't and have the black box. She, no, she has no black box. She has a big red button. And then she, <laughs> she's got a big emergency. She's like, no, we're not going to do that. So she, whenever we go to the black box thing, she's like, mm-hmm. I am not going to be in this meeting. I am not going to be in this meeting with you because you guys are doing that thing that you do. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, to answer your question, yes. You do? Yes. Uh, fascinating to to a certain amount I would say so like um, what was I working on Uh, oh when I was uh, writing scripts uh, with the Spice House guys earlier this year um, uh, thinking about uh, for a uh, who was the client it was a uh, meat delivery service it's like you know it's like sort of like Omaha Steaks kind of thing got it Um, but a different client Um, I mean I like thinking about the script like I just devoured every piece of their website right. and like looked up competitors and also sort of def- like listening to like, uh, like old country Western music too. Right. Yeah. Which, there you go. And like, I don't know if there was a conscious thing or what, but it, I just kind of went on like this bend, this bender of like old, like country Western music. My dad used to listen to awesome. you know, that kind of stuff. Perfect. Like, and it's just one example of like, I think it helped me. I don't know. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. But it, but it, at the time, it felt good. It felt right. Right. Same thing. It was like, uh, you know, um, I've got this sort of sci-fi horror movie script that I've that's been in a drawer forever that like I love. But like I would listen to like this like dark electronic music at night when I was listen, when I was when I was writing that, and then I, I went on a bender of like watching sci-fi movies and stuff. <laughs> like it all just like you said, you put certain things into the machine, right? And then you sort of crank the dial, and some it spits something very similar out the other end. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, it's, it is like that. I absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I can't, like, I can't, if I, if I need to focus on a, a genre of something in particular, like I'll take genres of other, the same genre, but in different mediums and sort of all put that together and surround myself in it. You know? So this, this is a, I'm going to take us down a little bit of a rabbit hole and you can cut this out in the final. <laughs> but I'm. have you ever noticed when people are thinking about things, they roll their eyes up, right? That, that they, I, Yeah, I do that. They, you do do that too, yeah. right. And there are a lot of people do do that. And it's interesting because I've thought a lot about this this depiction of mind, right? So it's not not your brain, but it's it's your working mind and and. How is your mind configured so that it allows you to do what you do? Because if you could figure it out, you could figure out ways to tweak it so that it's more efficient or works in a way that you want to do it. And there's there are a lot of theories about how mind is structured so that when you raise your eyes like that, you kind of look up into your head. And the way that you and that's how that's a that's a memory retrieval system is rolling your eyes up like that. That engages a memory retrieval thing. Oh. So it allows you to access files. It's like saying, oh, we, let's go to the card catalog on this. Right. So I there I've read a lot about this because I'm fascinated with the way <laughs> my mind works and how mm-hmm. little I know about the way my mind works. Mm-hmm. And I actually believe that I have a an actual physical space 
in my mind. It's a it's a, a barrel vaulted room that's rather ornately ceilinged. And it has, mm -hmm. it's like a big, beautiful library. Mm -hmm. And when I go into my mind, I can almost feel myself going into that, into a physical space. Mm -hmm. And that's the repository of all of my learned knowledge over my lifetime. It's all in there. And how I access it <laughs> is when I, when I think and I roll my eyes up and I kind of drift a little bit and I go to that place. You're looking up at the stacks. You're looks. looking at the stacks. Yeah. So... And I know that I do this, so I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I've taken us down this rabbit hole, but it's something that I've thought a lot about. And yeah. I, I'm fascinated because creative people do these same things. They have these same habits, but we don't think about what those habits mean and how universal they are, but they tell us something about how a creative human mind is structured. I think that's fascinating. It is really fascinating. And yes, he goes there. You, you can tell when he's there? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We'll be talking about, uh, you know, I'll read some article about some <laughs> science thing and and I'll look at him and, and he'll do that he'll be, thing. And he'll be like, yeah, I, I read about that in science. It was like October of 97. I'm like, what in the uh, heck? Like he can, he'll nerds pull. Nerds monthly episode. You know, right. He, he, can, he yes, will literally exactly. pull articles out of his head that he read. 15 years ago or 10 years or five years ago oh, or three but it, months and, ago. But it's filled with crap, I, you know, jingles oh, yeah, from 1960s yeah. cartoons. <laughs> you know? Same, yeah. My, my wife gets on me about this of like, how do you not remember this date that we went on? And yet you can remember this obscure kids cartoon that we watched that you watched 30 years ago. I'm yeah. Like, I don't know. This passwords. is just how it works. I can't remember passwords to save my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> by God, if you want to sing the theme song mm -hmm. to F Troop, I can cover that for you. <laughs> <laughs> See, it, in my head, I picture I'm either like in a movie, like I can picture a, this 3D space and like how something is like built or the way that like where the camera is going to be like in my brain. Like if I'm thinking about something, mm -hmm. like I can see where the camera is, like right. the POV yeah. basically. And I can be either in front of the camera and picture the things behind me, or I can be the camera and see the things in front of me. That's interesting. I don't you know. So the just, question is, did your, did you end up where you are because that was the natural architecture of your mind? Or did you build that architecture as you grew into your profession because I love architecture and books. Yeah. So I built mine as an architecturally significant library. So it, you know, that'd be know. really interesting to find out. I just think that I could do it. I, I'd love to just sit down with somebody, you know, and have dinner with them all night long and yeah. just talk about structures of mind. <laughs> On our next episode, the structure of the mind. And, and I do not have the black box. You don't have the black box. No. What do you do? You have something that's different, something that you sort of tap into to like a get black, the job. Black heart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, honey. I love you too. Um, no, I mean, or, or I just is I'm it just not... like focus and like I'm going to get this shit done. Yeah, I think it's I focus. I'm going to get this stuff done and. Um, I think I'm more, I don't know, kind of, I don't know how to describe what I do. I can, I can do 65 things at the same time. Right. Multitasker. All the time. Yeah. Like yeah. people will look at me and say, how, how do you function? Because I'm constantly interrupted and I'm, it. Yeah. Yeah. So my brain just works completely different. Right. Do you keep everything just kind of like everything's got a category and you're sort of checking things off as you go along or like? Yeah, I mean, I'm very I, I, organized. I, I imagine this sort of visually because that's just yeah. how I think. Yeah, I mean, I I'm, I'm, I make lists. I mean, I'm crazy about, I mean, like my, my text messages are my to-dos. So they stay on my phone until mm -hmm. I'm, I've completed this thing, like unless it's a family text because you know, they'll ignore it. Well, they'll text like, Hey, are we going to zoom on Saturday? Yes. Um, but for the most part, if a tenant would say, Hey, our sinks backed up or, you know, our team would say my computer is not working. If someone texts me, it stays there until I've fixed it and then delete them. Like it's, that's, Oh, I, okay. delete, delete, delete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's everything for me is keep a list. And then it comes off that and list. Then sweep it away. Yeah. Our done. oldest daughter is an emergency. She works in the pediatric ICU. 
at Children's Hospital. Cardiac wow. ICU. Cardiac ICU. Oh my god! And she is she has is not a planner. She would she would admit this, but she's fabulous about dealing with emergencies. So mm-hmm. if something comes up that has to be done, she can get it done without panicking and everything else. She's built more like Mary. She has the ability. She's not necessarily a long term, right? She's not necessarily. This is Katie, not Mary. Right. She's good at sort of taking care of things as they come in to her. That's mm-hmm. her process. And Mary's much more of a list based person. Let's get these things done. Let's make sure it goes. And she's fabulous about juggling lots and lots and lots and yeah, lots. And, nothing and just, I can't do that. Yeah. It would drive him crazy. He's like, shut the just door, don't me bother nuts. me. Right. I, I need to I need to focus. Yeah. And if I shut my door, I'd have, you know, six faces smashed up against the window like <laughs> That's true. You know, Mom. buildings burning down. And right. so I'm always like, I mean, people walk up, do you have a minute? It's like, sure. Thinking I have the phone ringing and right, yeah. need, yes, I have a minute. What do you need? And you just, yeah. you just switch and take care of it. And yeah. So Mary I does don't, HR, legal, tech, mm-hmm. billing, books. I mean, she just, she has so many things Fire, that she, I know. I don't know blood, how she does it. <laughs> right. You know, lights are out, tree blew over. I mean, it's just, I'm. It's crazy. Yeah. You keep everything running. Right. Yes. I do everything yeah. no one else the, wants to do. You That's let right. the dummies and creative focus and, and like yes. play with the ball. And yep. then you are the one actually doing the real work. That's right. Yeah. yeah and I'm yes. in awe Absolutely of watching yes. them. I think what's yeah. the most fun is just seeing what they do. It's so much fun to, I mean, I'm a part of it because yeah. it's, but I just, I get to watch stuff that comes in and. I'll open a job and think, wow, this sounds like so boring. Who's going to do this? And then they birth this thing that is just mind-blowingly mm-hmm. brilliant. And I'm, I love that. I think that's one of the most fun parts about like the – we don't work in the same exact industry, but we're – Right. Sort of our, our Venn diagram overlaps. Right. But like that's one of the most fun things is like taking something that's like – on paper is the most boring and dull thing ever and be like, let's put a little spice into that yeah, and absolutely. like make it fun. And I, I think I want clients that come to me and like know, know my brand as being like creative and fun and silly and right. wacky and stuff. And like, like we have this thing that we want to sell, but I, we don't know how to sell it. It's, it's not that exciting. Like, right. What can you do with it? And I was like, well, I can do 50 different things. <laughs> like a tip in my hat, like, here we go, boys, we're going to do 50 <laughs> different things with this thing. And then musical. <laughs> Um, but I, maybe you guys feel the same way. I think that's one of the most fun things. It's like not just starting with something that's like inherently already fun and cool and exciting, but like right. starting with something like a rock right? and like, how do we sell this rock? You know, <laughs> have you, have you had any clients like that over the years? Where oh, all of them, oh. <laughs> <laughs> all of them, if- every client's, every client has the opportunity to be horribly boring. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. The challenges, and if they were already great, then everybody's fighting over that client. So, mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely. The the trick is to take somebody who's not interesting and make them interesting, not doing something that everybody cares about, and make them something that's irresistible. That's the hard. That's the cool part. Everybody lives for that. And that's what being great at creative really is. Right. It doesn't matter who the client is. It doesn't matter... Mm-hmm. what the job is, what the title is, what matters is what we put into it to make it great. And you do right. that right until the moment that you fire them because they're boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say that. It's like, you you know, I've been in that situation where like I'll pitch what I think are really fun, creative, awesome, exciting ideas. And it just gets watered down. By the, by right. the time we're ready to shoot and edit, it's just like, oh, this is so disappointing. Right. Yeah, you know? it can, that can certainly happen. But sometimes, not, not all the clients. But not some. all the clients. But you know, sometimes at the end of the day, they are the client. Yeah. So you, yeah. Stephen I King guess. has this. Stephen King has this great story that he tells about writing books, and he calls it the 49th wave. And he says one out of every seven waves is a good wave. It's a good wave to surf on. Mm-hmm. But you only hit that perfect wave about one every seven times that you go out. So it's about one out of every 49 times that you step up to the project where you get the project that you want and you're in the place that you can hit it out of the park. 
and he says that about himself, that I can write all these books, and sometimes I'm just not in the right place for them, but I do it anyway. Yeah. But it's not my best work. There's nothing I can do about that. I can't control that. That's what the outcome is. Sometimes you publish them, sometimes you shelve them, and you wait to see what happens later. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with us. I mean, we we are going to do our best every single time, but you know, we also try to say, take the long view. What did we learn from this? Let's do better next time. Let's see if we can make it better. And we've gotten, I mean, let's hope that over 25 years of, of, of this firm's life that we've gotten better at walking clients through, the, through it. And we've built up our arsenal and our brain of all those little arguments that you have to have to cajole them into doing what you're going to do and figure out all the little ways that you can politically work around them to get what you need to have done. So we've gotten much better about getting our way even when clients don't agree with us. Is that just an ex- an experience thing? And, and like, like, here's our portfolio. Here's all the awards that we won. You should maybe listen to us. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it, it's knowing. We had a big presentation today. We had done. Uh, we're doing logos for this um, company out of Boston, and we had gone through two rounds of logos. We thought we had a great logo. At the end of the second round, and then they found a an obscure competitor in uh, Arizona mm-hmm. who they never compete with, but it, they had a similar, it was a logo that was close enough that made them say, we can't go to market with this logo that you guys have come up with. Same industry. Same industry, okay. two different markets, a, a 250 person company that we're working for versus a 12 person company that they found in Arizona. Mm-hmm. But it was close enough that they first sent us an email and said, what do you think? And I said, not close at all. Don't worry about it. And then they said, we think it's too close. We can't do it. So round three, we came back today and we showed them an entirely new set of work. And this time I kind of knew how they'd react and we were able to guide them through a presentation. And at the end they were like, that was great. That was what we needed to see. We understand. And it wasn't because we had different people working on it, or we were particularly brilliant in the third round, but we had learned how they needed to be spoken to and how we needed to set it up. So I had this mm-hmm. huge walkthrough, um, sort of a setup phase before we even got into the creative work about these logo designs and how what a logo is and why how it has to function. What is a logo? Right. And why you use a logo and why why do some people do these fancy things and some people do these really so all this stuff. It was all just a, a way to get them their expectations and and set have them re-see the problem in my terms. And once I knew that that's what they how they needed to see it. And not only that, that only comes from the experience of having worked with these guys now for six months, being able to say, here's what we need to give to you. And mm-hmm. it's going to work. Did it? Did they end up going with the first logo that you wanted or one of the newer ones? One of the, but, but the new ones, but the ones that we wanted of the new ones. Very, okay. Right. Good. So it worked? Yes, it worked. <laughs> but it was – and so I think that you just – man, you just get better about that stuff. You kind of sure. just learn how to read the room better. And we're always farting and, around with it. That and ta- you have to learn how to talk their language. You know, they're all yeah. different. Their brains are all different. So yeah. by getting to know them and understanding what they need to hear, you can – or the team can – find a way to, to get them to choose which version we want them to choose. It's just, you know, what order do we show them in and why? Right. Because some clients, you want it to be the first thing you show. Other mm-hmm. clients, you don't want it to be the last thing. So they, they, the team has gotten really great at learning who the clients are and how they need to receive in order to set up the presentation to guide them to the answer we want them to choose. What's the strategy for this meeting? Like, how do we line up our right our yeah. attacks? Right. So, if we're showing so five logos, which one do we want? The one we want them to choose first, or third, or fifth? Like, mm-hmm. we, and they've gotten great at getting to know the clients well enough, asking the right questions, understanding how their brains work, to know how to present, how to how to show the work that we yeah. do, 
to get the results that we hopefully will get. It doesn't always work, but it, yeah. it seems to more and more. I find that incredibly fascinating. Yeah. I think if, if you talk to anybody who's been in the business long enough that they're like, oh, yeah, there's tricks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like it's it seems like 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 a little mini psychological warfare. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like absolutely battle, is. Where right. You're, you're like manipulating it's a seduction. Them. Yes. It's a seduction. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think it's, that's 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 almost more fascinating. Baby, it's like cold that. outside. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah <it's> like, <laughs> oh, you don't want that logo. You don't want that logo, baby. It's yeah. this one over here. Yeah. I really like B. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Softly playing some music in the me. background to influence <laughs> That's that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so uh, you guys are married, and you've been married for how long now? Uh, 29 years you get it right. in, in a month. In 29 years in a month. In Is that two right? weeks. Two, three weeks. Yeah. Two okay. weeks. So back in 97, when you were starting Toki. Yeah. From there until now, like, there's probably been some bumps in the road where you're, you know, you're probably oh, like, yeah. you're pissed at each other about whatever. But like, no, not no. so much. Really? No, never. Fantastic. Not not Amazing. at each other. Oh, okay, well, good. No. Other people. Other people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I mean, what what are what have been some of the challenges and like and like challenges and benefits to working with your business partner and your life partner, them being the same person? Well. Trust. I think, yeah, trust you. And yeah. I think you always know where the other one's at in their head. You know, you worry about everything together. You celebrate everything together. You're, um, you just have a deep understanding of what each of you go through daily. So, you know, I know if there's a client issue, I know if there's a team issue, I know I, I'm in, I'm in, in the mud with him. So mm -hmm. you're, you're just you do it together so it makes it a lot easier when things go wrong it's more celebratory when things go right yeah. and you just know yeah. someone has my back if i'm just having a bad day or week or month or whatever you know you never let each other down um at least we haven't so no yeah i mean the hard things that we've had in the last 25 years have, have really been external right i mean it's recessions in 2001 2008 yeah. 2020. Yeah. Um, you know, those kinds of things, they suck. I mean, they're horrible when they hit, but we've we've gone through them enough now that um we kind of are like, oh, here we go again. And we mm -hmm. we know that we'll be okay. And if we keep our heads down, and you know, we're we're thrifty. We're thrifty Scots people, so we're <laughs> we're we like um you know, we still have the same, we still work on the same Ikea desks that we bought in 1997. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, awesome. I, we're, yeah, we don't spend a lot of money on, on, stuff. on glamour, yeah. right? It's, it's so that we say, can put the are, money into the work. Uh, so you mentioned sort of um, going through all the external mm -hmm. crises and issues over the years, like recessions and pandemics and right. et cetera, et cetera. Like, how have you learned to manage those and come out the other side, you know, without tearing each other's hair out? Uh, and then did you, you know, in a piggyback onto that 25 years ago, did you see yourselves then as you are now? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Really? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our first, our first space when we uh, started in 97 we, um, do you remember Blake Brokaw was a restaurateur in town? He had like fat, uh, what was it? Something Buddha? The only Brokaw I know is Tom Brokaw. No, this is Blake Brokaw. Me. He was a restaurateur in St. Louis. He had a lot of restaurants. He was a sort of a well known restaurateur. And he had a, a I'm not lentil. from St. Louis originally. Well, that's all right. It's, okay. it's not a, it's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to be. Everybody has flaws, <laughs> Bill. So don't. That's my one flaw. <laughs> that's, that's right. So we uh, Blake had a uh, a five thousand square foot lentil factory on the top floor of the city of what will become the city museum building. Hang on, what is a lentil factory? He would sh shell or process lentils for use in his restaurants. He, oh. So he would import raw lentils gotcha. and soak them, I think, and then mm -hmm. shell them. I'm not a lentil guy, so I will <laughs> I have to take a pass on knowing the process. 
But he had this horrible, smelly 5,000 square foot place on the top floor of, the, of that of the building that became the city museum building, which mm-hmm. at the time was a shooting gallery for junkies. And cool. And so that was our first office. And it was 5,000 square foot, and it was a dollar a square foot to lease. So um, the no AC, no heat, and panes of glass panes missing. Panes of from glass the in the big industrial windows were missing. And you wanted this place. And I wanted that place. And it was 5,000 square feet. Because it was big enough feet. to grow the business. Yeah. yeah. So we were able, we figured we could get 15 to 20 people in into that office yeah. before we outgrew it. So we were trying to give ourselves enough runway that we could make that work. And we did indeed grow to yeah. that size in that space. Uh, and um, over time, we took out the the uh, train spotting bathroom that it came with yeah. and and <laughs> and fixed the windows and put and, in and AC. And built a foyer and, that and actually had a door that was Got rid of the junkies who were yeah. trying to break in at night when we were doing 20-hour days there. They tried to Oof. break in at two in the morning and I'd be in there working on my, you know, little $14 an hour project (laughs) and calling Mary because I wanted to make sure she knew where the will was in case I got killed. (laughs) Three o'clock in the morning, there's somebody outside the door. I'm like, what am I going to (laughs) do? Come and get me. me. Yeah. Um, And we uh, tried to build the business so that it was durable. Um, Mm -hmm. We were involved with another company that was rather spendthrift during the dot-com roll-up and uh, spent a lot of money. Uh, and it turned out that that was not a good plan for them because when the dot-com bubble burst, mm-hmm. uh, they rode a bunch of bankruptcies straight down into having to sell the company. And our little business, which was still a part of that business, survived and was the only thing that was left after every all the other pieces of the company had burned away. And it was oh, wow. because we were in our dollar a square foot space with IKEA desks and were built for yeah. thriftiness. And, and in 2008, we saw the recession coming and we pulled our team into a room and said, everybody batten down the hatches. It's going to be rough the next six months. Start saving now. And yeah. everybody did. And we ended up having some really good years because we we had enough time, enough foresight to be able to go out and find some counter cyclical clients in healthcare that got us through the recession. And uh, we came out stronger in 2010 than a lot of companies. So I think we've just, we just learned how to write it. And um, I don't know, we just. We also, you know, if you're an owner of a place of a creative shop, You have to get used to rewarding yourself in good years and taking no salary in bad years. Hmm. Because if you don't do that, you have to fire staff. And then people expect that you are going to look after yourself first and the team second. And they'll reward that disloyalty with short term and leaving and wanting as much as they can extort from you. And we always put our staff first and said, we're going to cut our salaries to zero and we'll support you guys through these three recessions. And we've done it it three times and got the team through and the team stayed intact. And and we've been rewarded by having people who've been with us for, in some cases, 24 years, 20 years. Wow. We did the same for vendors. I mean, we had, there was a couple of years where some of our clients didn't pay their bills, but they had... Hmm. you know, bills that needed to be paid by really important vendors of ours. And we paid them because we didn't want our vendors to get hosed because our clients weren't, yeah, didn't make it through. There are other, so it's just, it's, it's called doing well. the right thing. Yeah. yeah. There's you know, small businesses we, too. Right. We've always right. done the right thing and taking care of the team. And if mm-hmm. it means, oh, okay, we're not going to get paid for a year. It's like, okay. And money's money. Once you, we, you know, the good years, yeah. you get money in the bank. Yeah. And then when the bad years come along, you live on the money. It's it's not a it's not a you know, it's not fun, but it's okay. Well, no. but it it's usually important. doesn't last that long. But it's right. more important to not cut team. I mean, there's a right. lot of companies mm-hmm. where it's like they get the client work and they grow and then the client goes away and they lay all these people off. I mean, and that's just Yeah, it's just terrible I, horrible. bust cycle. Horrible. It was one yeah. of the things And they design their structure so around these team pods yeah. so that they can wipe out a t- pod efficiently. Mm-hmm. They're 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 structured 
to jettison that limb. It's like, it's an arm. We can cut that arm off. Yeah. Boop, there one, it goes. It's their pinky toe. Well, we'll regrow that arm I later on. Really important. No, those people are traumatized. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Well, it's, it's not about... I hate the, those kinds of companies. Yeah, it's not about the people for them. No. Like, like, on your scale, and my scale is about the yeah. people you work with, because I want to work with people that... I care about and then right. I get along with and enjoy and do g- great work. Right. And you so. don't want them sitting in the corner wondering, am I going to get laid off tomorrow because, you know, right. the economy's going to shit? Like, n- we don't want that. We no. want them to know, no, you're good. No. We got gotcha. you. We've got yeah. you. Just do your thing. Yeah. And that's sort of how we've been from day one. And then again, this comes back down to she and I being married and not being two un related partners who may have disagreements about this but she and i are able to move in lockstep you know i I come from three generations of mom and pop shops and i like mom and pop shops i i think that they create stability if you're lucky yeah same yeah yeah well mary eric toki of toki Thank you guys so yeah, much for, for coming. Uh, this has been a really great conversation. I, I've really just, th- this is a cup filling conversation for me. I think this is, this is very good for me. So mm. this is all about just me. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having Pleasure. me. Pleasure. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. This is Bill Parmentier with Old Storm Studios on behalf of Splice House, who runs this show, Pre-Pro Podcast. Thank you. We will see you next time. Adios. Adios.